Hello, welcome to Classical Destinations. I'm Simon Callow and I'm in Budapest, beautiful capital city of Hungary. Today, we're going to look at the life and times of Franz Liszt, one of the world's greatest composers, and perhaps the greatest pianist who ever lived. And then we'll look at the lives of two great 20th century Hungarian composers, Zoltán Kodály and Béla Bartók, perhaps the greatest of all 20th century composers. If you should ever tire of Rome or of Paris, Budapest awaits. It's a city of superlative beauty and vibrancy that's been uniquely shaped through nearly 2,000 years of history. It seems that there were people living around here as early as the Paleolithic era, and it was the Romans who settled on this site in AD 100. As with so many of Europe's great cities, Budapest began as a river crossing point. The legendary Attila the Hun finally got rid of the Romans at the start of the fifth century, and the nomadic Magyars, the ancestors of today's Hungarians, arrived at the end of the eighth century. Budapest's history is then one of invasions, revolutions, rebellions. The city always revived and rebuilt. Here in the beautifully preserved town of Centendre, on the city's northern fringes, you can experience what Budapest would have been like during the 18th and 19th centuries. The flavor is Christian Orthodox, adopted after Hungary emerged from 150 years of Turkish occupation. Sitting as it does, right at the very heart of Europe, but also in close proximity to the east, Hungary has at times been joined with the west and the east, so Budapest is a veritable treasure trove of architectural styles and cultural influences. When King Bela IV set up his capital here back in 1267, he picked this hilltop site because it would be very easy to defend. Of course, he didn't have World War II bombers in mind at the time, and Budapest's old town, including a lavish royal palace built by the Habsburgs, was almost entirely destroyed. But the restoration has been so meticulous, Budapest's remarkable history again comes alive in these streets and squares. Everywhere you look, there's beauty and splendor, and that's even before you take in the expansive views across to the newer parts of the city. Budapest is also a rich mixture of religions. This is St. Stephen's Basilica, dedicated to Istvan Stephen, Hungary's first Christian king, who reigned nearly 1,000 years ago. Inside is a most unusual relic, Istvan's mummified right forearm. If Budapest's Grand Parliament building looks vaguely familiar, that's because it was modeled on London's Houses of Parliament. It was Hungary's birthday present to itself, as was the Millennium Monument to celebrate 1,000 years of statehood. No great city is truly complete without a great opera house, and Budapest's was built to rival those of Vienna, Paris, and Dresden. And here at Vaida Hunyad Castle, a millennium of architectural styles is packed into one building. And here's another surprise a neo-baroque swimming pool. These are the Seychenyi baths, the deepest and hottest in Budapest. You can swim here all year round, although swimming might be considered a bit too active. How about a steamy game of chess instead? The great and beautiful Budapest, one of the great cities of the Danube. Liszt only came here occasionally as a boy, and in fact, when he came here, it wasn't Budapest at all. He visited Pest, which is on the east bank of the river. Over there is Buda, where the royal palace was, and beyond, where the flats are, in the middle distance, the city of Obuda. These three cities came together in 1873 to form one of the greatest metropolises of Europe. Hungary was under Austrian rule when Franz Liszt was born in 1811. 
In fact, just two years earlier, the mighty Habsburgs had moved their court from Vienna to Budapest to put more distance between themselves and the marauding Napoleon. Budapest is an intensely involving place. Visually, of course, it's spectacular, but it's the sheer variety that's packed into such a comparatively small area which makes it so special, and the fact that so much of it had to be rebuilt after the Second World War. And one of the best ways to appreciate what has been achieved in the modern Budapest is a cruise along the Danube. Just as in Paris, so many of the city's historical and beautiful buildings are situated on the river's banks. The Royal Palace, the inner city parish church, which marks the first crossing point, and that magnificent parliament building. Liszt was another of classical music's child prodigies. And just like Mozart, his father wasted no time taking his young son on the road to perform around Europe. At one such concert in Vienna, there was somebody very special in the audience, Beethoven. At the end of the performance, he went up to the stage, bodily lifted the 12-year-old Liszt off his piano stool and kissed him on the forehead. It was the anointing of a successor. Yet the brilliant career nearly didn't get much further. Aged just 17, exhausted from all the touring and devastated by the end of his first big love affair, Liszt announced he was retiring from music to take up religious studies. The virtuoso violin playing of Paganini lured him back. The rest of Liszt's life would be anchored at three points, music, religion, and love. Here we are outside the Franz Liszt Academy of Music. This is one of its most distinguished alumni, Zoltan Kodai, great 20th century Hungarian composer and teacher. Here's Ferenc Erkel, who composed Bach Ban, which is the great Hungarian national opera. He wrote the Hungarian national anthem, too. And here, finally, is the great man himself, Franz Liszt, Liszt Ferenc in Hungarian. Towards the end of his life, he felt the need to come back to Hungary, and he became a very frequent visitor from the early 1870s. And in 1877, he bought himself an apartment here in Budapest, which then became the Franz Liszt Music Academy. Let's go inside. And here's the room where Bartok and Kodai, as young music students, studied. But of course, it was in Liszt's own time, in his own apartment, the room where he taught his piano students. And here sat the student in question at a Bosendorfer donated by the manufacturer himself, while Liszt sat at the Chickering piano, which he'd had designed to his own specifications. And above it is this stupendous silver music stand um, commissioned by his friends among the Hungarian musical community and dominated by his own musical idols, Karl Maria von Weber, Ludwig van Beethoven, Franz Schubert. Liszt's idols inspiring him. He sits there right in the middle of it all. And just behind it is this remarkable portrait of Liszt in his late 40s, the composer as Hamlet somehow stunningly dramatic, brooding, Byronic figure. To see a, a version of the earlier list, we need to look at this portrait, uh, painted by a Hungarian portraitist in Liszt's late 20s. And there you really do get the sense. The man who was basically a great rock star of his day. Women fainted, men wept, uh, taken not only by the extraordinary genius of his piano playing, nobody had ever heard anything like that before, but by his whole physical presence, that tiny wasp-like waist, that extraordinary profile, those penetrating eyes. He just exuded sexual charisma, quite frankly, and everybody was not sideways. But many, many, many years later, that rock star had turned into that venerable figure, the Abbe Liszt, um, having minor orders from the Roman Catholic Church, and even in his late 70s, still exploring, pushing the boundaries of music, writing some of the most peculiar, challenging, enigmatic, altogether remarkable piano music which has ever been written. Now this is the study bedroom and it contains the artifacts relating to Liszt's more intimate private life, including this enchanting little piano harmonium which has glass slices instead of strings. Up on the wall are 
pictures, photographs of his family life. Here are his three children from Marie Dagou, one of whom, Cosima, went on to marry Richard Wagner, who thus, of course, became Liszt's son-in-law. These are Liszt's parents, Anna and Adam. That's his very severe-looking grandfather. Even more severe is the woman with whom he spent his middle years, the Princess Caroline Sein Wittgenstein. Over here, an absolutely crucial part of Liszt's life, just by the bed, his religious life. It meant a great deal to him. There was no hypocrisy in it. He was so passionate that he even took minor orders in the Roman Catholic Church and produced an extraordinary amount of ex very powerfully felt religious music. An oratorio called Christus and uh, a, a number of very, very strong choral pieces. His God, to whom he prayed, his rosary, which he traveled with him wherever he went. Over here, an unusual thing, wasn't here, of course, in his own lifetime, um, a bronze cast of his hand, which is most surprising in that it reveals quite a dainty little hand for such a supreme virtuoso. You might have expected much longer, stronger fingers. But what is remarkable is the rather long thumb, which must, of course, have given him great strength. And here is an extraordinary novelty, a writing desk made for him by the piano manufacturer, Bersendorfer, which includes a tiny little three-octave keyboard. So if he was hit with sudden inspiration, he could always run it up the flagpole. Liszt certainly isn't alone among the great composers for being something of a contradictory character. The greatest contradiction in his life was that his deeply held religious beliefs seemingly weren't strong enough to overcome the weaknesses of the flesh. His love affairs were many, passionate, and all-consuming. But then, all or nothing appeared to be very much the Liszt way, and classical music is the richer for it. We have Liszt to thank for the symphonic tone poem, many harmonic and thematic conventions, and even the solo piano recital. And, of course, a vast amount of music, both secular and sacred. His influence has been profound, and it extended far into the 20th century. The small music school he'd established in his own apartment grew into a national institution and eventually found a home in a magnificent three-story palace in central Pest. In 1925, it was named the Franz Liszt Academy of Music, and appropriately, the statue erected over its entrance gazes out across the Franz Liszt Square. In 1907, 21 years after Liszt's death, this magnificent school opened in his name, a fitting culmination of a lifetime's work promoting not only his contemporaries' music, but that of his great predecessors, and above all, those of the younger generation, whom he encouraged with extraordinary generosity. In fact, Franz Liszt has a good claim to be regarded as the most generous composer who ever lived. With two concert halls, a state-of-the-art recording studio, and an extensive resource center, today this academy is one of Europe's premier music institutions. And in the true spirit of Liszt, both those young music students who'd studied at the apartment school returned here as teachers themselves. Indeed, Zoltan Kodai went on to pioneer a revolutionary new method of teaching children to read music, which is now used around the world. Franz Liszt died in 1886, just two years before that, this magnificent building, the Opera House in Budapest, was opened. It's a tribute to the vitality and excitement of musical life in Budapest at the time. This was the height of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and all such buildings had to be approved by the emperor himself. Somewhat reluctantly, he did so, insisting, however, that it must not be any bigger than the Opera House in Vienna. When it opened, he examined it and found that it was, indeed, not any bigger than the Opera House in Vienna. Somewhat grumpily, he observed, I should have asked for it not to be any nicer than the Opera House in Vienna, which it is. It is, very proudly, a thoroughly Hungarian building. It was designed by a Hungarian. Indeed, it was the life's work of the prominent Hungarian architect Miklos Ibel. And the grand interior was entirely decorated by Hungarian artists. You can see why the Emperor Franz Josef I was a little miffed. It's quite, quite beautiful. Every September, commencing on the anniversary of the death of Bella Bartok, 
The Budapest Contemporary Music Weeks celebrate 20th century classical music. And everywhere you go, in the squares, bars and restaurants, you'll hear the rich sounds of Hungarian folk music. The music which inspired Liszt's evocative Hungarian rhapsodies, as well as the work of both Bartok and Kodai. In 1938, when the Austrian people voted to join the Third Reich, Bartok saw the writing on the wall and he left his country for America. Kodai, however, determined to soldier on, to maintain the musical traditions for which he'd spent his whole life fighting. But eventually, in 1944, when the German bombs were about to fall, he was in mortal danger. He was hidden here, in the opera house, underground, with his family, for two long weeks until he was finally released. Zoltan Kodai was born in central Hungary in 1882. This is where he lived and worked in Budapest from 1924 until his death in 1967, and it's now a fascinating museum. Kodai was an exceptional character whose interest in music extended beyond composing to teaching, which was a lifelong passion, and to intensive research, for which he travelled as far afield as North Africa. Like so many of the early 20th century composers, Kodai wanted his music to have a distinctive identity, a distinctly Hungarian identity, and he found it in folk songs, gypsy dances, and centuries-old church music. But he also found, much to his alarm, that this early music was in great danger of disappearing completely. Kodai dedicated his whole life to its preservation, in the process becoming one of the earliest sound recordists, and it made him a national hero. This is uh, what you would call an Edison phonograph. And this uh, machine uh, has a double function because this was the ancestor of the modern time tape recorder. So Kodai took this apparat with him on his folklore, folk song collecting trips. And he asked the singer with whom he had to make friends first so that the person would be not inhibited enough to, to sing for him and then have the, the person stand in front of this funnel here and sing right into the machine. And there was a wax cylinder and the needle that was uh, close to the cylinder would make a, a line or some kind of a sign. And then this machine is again ready to play it back. Uh, so when he returned from his folk song collecting trips, then putting on the wax cylinder, this machine would serve as a, a loudspeaker. Kodai also wrote down very clearly and very meticulously all the folk songs that people sang for him. He would copy the songs, and if he had any other information, like if there was a folk custom, that would be copied on the paper as well. And he made some photos of the people who sang for him, as well as the customs, the dresses people wore, the circumstance of their living. So this is really an ethnographic study that he has done with, with, together with the folk songs. Education, preservation, and of course, creation. Kodai's legacy to music is immense. This is Pasaret, an elegant Buddha suburb in the foothills where Bela Bartok came to live in 1932. He moved here from the inner city for the peace and quiet, and this three-story villa was his home until he fled Hungary in 1940. Today it's a museum with a small concert hall that was created from the first floor living quarters. Like Kodai, Bartok was fascinated by the heritage of Hungarian music and the pair often traveled together on field studies. It's hard to say who was the greater collector of ethnic artifacts on these trips. An ardent admirer of Richard Strauss, Bartok explored modernism almost as enthusiastically as he explored early music, distilling these elements into wonderfully expressive and evocative music. Bartok never saw his homeland again. 
But his vital contribution to Hungarian music, indeed to 20th century classical music, is recognized in Budapest's Bartok National Concert Hall, opened in 2005 and home to the Hungarian National Philharmonic Orchestra. Before we have to leave Budapest, let's enjoy this truly captivating city one more time and the music of Bartok played here by our resident musicians, the Australian Chamber Orchestra. Castle district of Budapest, a great celebration of Hungarian national identity. Now, Franz Liszt was far from a nationalist. He was one of the most cosmopolitan of men and composers. And yet his roots were definitely here, here in Hungary. But during the course of his long life, he associated with and influenced an extraordinary diverse range of composers. Chopin, Sassos, Berlioz, Wagner, right through to Debussy, Faure, Grieg, Borodin. He provides a link between the early romanticism of the 19th century to modern musical adventurism. And as such, he's an absolutely key figure on our journey through classical music. Our next destination is Italy, where we'll be meeting two very different composers, Rossini, one of romantic opera's leading lights, and Respighi, who, very unusually for an Italian, didn't write any opera at all. Goodbye from Simon Callow in Budapest. <laughs>